So let's go on and talk about MR of articular cartilages. Okay, so we're going to talk about structure of articular cartilage, some of the pathophysiology of disease of articular cartilage, talk about uh, imaging and uh, biochemical type imaging, anatomic imaging, and then uh, what treatment things look like. So are there are multiple layers of, uh, of uh, articular cartilage, and depending upon what paper you read, you may have anywhere from three to 11 or 12 different layers of articular cartilage, but in reality, they're not really layers, it's a continuous change of the, uh, uh, the, the molecular content of the articular cartilage and structure of the articular cartilage from the base layer, uh, the calcified zone, all the way up to the surface. Uh, in the superficial layers, the collagen fibers are mostly oriented uh, horizontally. Uh, in the middle, they're more random, as we'll see in a minute. And then at the deep, the collagen fibers per are perpendicular to the uh, bone and actually then attach uh, end on in into the calcified layer of the bone. Uh, another way to look at this uh, and some other things there are more layers where you have the superficial layer, again, where the collagen fibers are mostly horizontal. Ash, were you able to join us? Ash, you? Yeah, I'm here now. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, then uh, below that, the, the, the collagen fibers are still mostly horizontal, but they're starting to make a transition. Then you get in a transition area where the collagen fibers are more randomly located. Here you all have a cellular component, and then they become more radial, and then in the calcified layer, they're, they're really more vertical. Another way to look at it that I like to look at it is really the following. Uh, this is from a chapter in our textbook a number of years ago that was written by, by all. Uh, what you have, the structure, is basically collagen fibers, which we see are the white things here. And they attach uh, to the deep calcified layer by the bone down below. They come up and loop where you get to the surface and then go back down again. And, uh, uh, but, but if you just, if all you had were these uh, uh, collagen fibers, they would press down. If you put any pressure on it, they would have no rigidity. They just collapse down to the bone and they would break. So what you then have, along with these collagen fibers, you've got hyaluronic acid, which is a very long molecule, which we see here, that weaves in and out among the collagen fibers. And attached to the hyaluronic acid are these uh, kind of bottle brush type proteins uh, called chondroitin and chondroitin sulfate uh, and here. Uh, uh, and these little uh, blue things are water molecules that are, that are absorbed onto the ends, the tips of the bottle brush. And it's what this acts like, it, it sucks in water, and water, sucking in water to this kind of blows it up like blowing air to, into a balloon. And that's what gives rigidity to the uh, cartilage structure. Uh, and uh, therefore, these uh, chondroitin sulfates and uh, uh, molecules and the water that it absorbs actually add rigidity to the structure of the collagen, which protects the collagen and gives cartilage the structure it has. Now, one thing that can happen is if you put pressure on uh, this complex, now all this can compress, and as it compresses, it becomes uh, able to handle more and more pressure. And it's what this actually does is allow when you compress it, it distributes it. it cause an indentation of the cartilage, uh, the water is kind of moved peripherally and it actually increased the contact area over which the two surfaces of articular cartilage uh, contact each other. And if you have a given pressure, I mean, if you have a given force, the pressure on the intervening structures is basically the force divided by the area that the force is transmitted through. So the larger the area with the same amount of force, you have less pressure. So this is a mechanism where the articular cartilage protects itself because the more force you have, uh, the more deformity you get of the articular cartilage, which spreads the contact surface over a larger area, which actually decreases the pressure. And when you lose uh, hyaluronic acid or use, uh, lose uh, the uh, uh, keratin sulfates and chondral, chondral sulfates here uh, in this area, and you lose that water, what happens is that the cartilage is no longer able to redistribute the forces, 
and one of its protective mechanisms is lost. And therefore, when you start to get degenerative disease of the cartilage and you get the biochemical changes, the cartilage then becomes more sensitive to further trauma and can deteriorate more rapidly. So the kind of a higher view of, a, kind of, a, of this shows the uh, hyaluronic acid here, uh, the keratin sulfate and the water that is absorbed to it, the chondroitin sulfate and uh, absorbing the water molecules in this process. Uh, this is a little a cartoon from Debbie Bernstein, who's a researcher at, at Harvard, kind of showing the same thing. Inside this, you have cells, which are important uh, to maintain uh, the integrity of, the, of these molecules because they get broken and, and this can, uh, the cells can kind of fix it. So here we have the glucose aminoglycans here, uh, the keratin sulfates and so forth, uh, the collagen fibers, and uh, here's the structure. Uh, this is what those little spicules look like uh, biochemically here, uh, which absorb the water molecules. Uh, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, so, uh, so that's kind of theoretically the way it functions. This was an article from a long time ago in radiology, probably about 1990, uh, talking about the structure, function, and degeneration of bovine hyaline cartilage. Uh, uh, we were actually working a little bit with bovine cartilage at the time, and, and its assessment with MR imaging. Uh, here's what we see here. This is kind of a cow patella on the right. This is a cell, a, a disc. Uh, 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 here, that's being pressed against the cartilage. This is the calcified layer of cartilage. This is the trabecular bone. Uh, here we can see uh, the cartilage itself. The dark areas are the, super, the superficial areas of the cartilage, which are primarily, which have a high water content. Uh, the areas down below have a lower water content. This is a T1 weighted image. So you can see the redistribution of the water on the surface where you have the pressure from this disc on the cartilage. So that redistribution that we just talked about, uh, this is what it actually looks like on an MR study. And you can see that uh, if, if you actually had two rigid surfaces here, one flat and one curved, the contact would be very small in here. But because you have a deformed deformity of the, of the cartilage, you get a much larger contact surface here and therefore a decreased pressure for the same force. So uh, yeah, here's, here's a histologic uh, uh, specimen of cartilage. Here's the trabecular bone down below. The calcified layer is right across here where the cartilage adheres to the bone. We can see a deep layer here and then a superficial layer up through there. And here we can see erosion of the superficial layer down into the deep layer. So when this is uh, uh, grade uh, two to three chondromalacia here, and this is the normal articular cartilage there. On a T1-weighted image on these old scanners, we can see the superficial area is dark because it has a lot of water content. The uh, deeper layer is brighter because it has less water and also has more uh, protein in terms of uh, the uh, uh, collagen. So that's a little bit about the basic uh, an, an, uh, anatomy of the articular cartilage. Now, in clinically evaluating articular cartilage, every pulse sequence that's ever been developed has been used to try to look at articular cartilage. Uh, here are just, just some of them. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to go through a few of these, uh, but, but not as many as I used to, because there are only some that have become uh, 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 very useful. So these are the ones that we're going to primarily concentrate on uh, on the right. So this is some very early studies that we did. This was bovine articular cartilage. This was using about 19, must have been about 1990. Uh, and well, we just put a little one centimeter, a single loop surface coil on top of the cartilage. Uh, this is a, a proton density image on the left and a uh, T2 weighted image on the right. And this is the old-fashioned true T2-weighted image, not the fast spinaco ones that we have now. So this is actually, this is really a, better, a pretty good mapping of the actual T2 characteristics of the tissues. Uh, so what we see on the T2 is a superficial layer is very bright. That's because you have a lot of free fluid here, or a lot of free water. The water molecules are able to diffuse freely, uh, and therefore you get a uh, broadening of the resonance. And, and you get a very 
uh, high signal intensity on the uh, on the T2 weighted image. The deeper layers, the water is being constrained by these collagen fibers that are more dense in the deeper layers, and you get a lot of more kind of uh, uh, one. The, the water is constrained more, so it's not freely flowing, uh, and therefore you have a more decrease in the T2 time, and you also get some susceptibility changes because of the interface between the water and the collagen molecules here. The proton density basically is just telling you what the distribution of the water is, uh, and you can see that there's still a fair amount of water in the deep structures, but a lot superficially as well. And also notice that if you actually have high enough resolution, you can see the normal undulation of the articular cartilage here. So back in 1990, uh, we could get very high resolutions of the articular cartilage. Uh, you can't do this in vivo because we don't we can't put a coil right on top of the articular cartilage and we can't get anywhere near the signal to noise that we could get in this in vitro study so uh, uh let's just go through these techniques the, the the main limitations are really twofold in evaluating articular cartilage with mr one is you need contrast to be able to detect the biochemical changes and anatomic changes in the articular cartilage that you think may be clinically relevant. So that's the pulse sequence. And the other is we have to have adequate spatial resolution uh, to be able to see the articular cartilage. And of these two, the biggest problem we have right now is actually getting spatial resolution. You really need to do it in 3D, otherwise you blur out a lot of the details. If you have thick cuts, even though your in-plane resolution may be high, your through plane resolution needs to be high as well. Uh, and that's primarily a signal to noise problem. So theoretically, it should be improved by going to higher fields. There are actual problems, however, with going to higher fields because it turns out that the contrast you get from a lot of these techniques vary with field strength. And some of the contrast that you need for biochemistry, you start losing at higher fields. And um, no, we, if you guys want to talk about physics, uh, I could give a three or four weeks physics lectures later, uh, but uh, the fellows in the last couple of years haven't wanted the physics lecture. So, but, but anyway, uh, th that really has to do with the, the molecules that you're looking at. Uh, the water is a small molecule, and therefore it vibrates very rapidly. Most of the other molecules that we're talking about are very large molecules, so their modes of vibration are actually at relatively low frequency. As you go to higher and higher field strengths, you start working with higher and higher frequencies, and they are the sweet spot of contrast is dependent upon the frequency. If you have a the, if the RF frequency is close to the vibration frequency of the molecules you're talking about, you can get a lot of uh, very interesting contrast. Uh, <clears throat> But as you go into higher and higher field strengths, uh, a lot of the interest that you have really are in the large molecules, uh, which tend to vibrate at much lower frequencies, so you start use, losing contrast. Uh, but we'll get into that. Now, I, I'm going to go through this fairly rapidly because this is important a number of years ago, but not so important now. So we're going to look at different gradient echo techniques. A lot of gradient echoes, especially at 1.5 T, have very poor contrast. Here we can see we can't really differentiate the fluid from the articular cartilage uh, <clears throat> with that technique. We can do fat suppression. doesn't necessarily improve the contrast of the soft tissues. It just gets rid of the signal intensity we have from fat. If you change the flip angle, uh, we can start getting a little different contrast. looks a little bit more like T1-weighted images. Uh, fat, this is contrast. Uh, <clears throat> we can use some other, other techniques to try to get uh, better imaging here, the fluid is actually low in signal intensity. The articular cartilage is bright, but it turns out uh, you can miss a lot of uh, uh, even big lesions with this particular contrast. So the bottom line is we found it certainly in high fields that most gradient echo techniques did not give reliable contrast. Some people still use them for the morphology because you can get rapid imaging at fairly high resolution. You can do 3D imaging. But uh, I've found the contrast isn't very reliable for different kinds of degenerative disease. You can do fast spin echo. So here is a, uh, a T2 weighted fast spin echo image. And here we can see a lot of interesting contrast. You can see that the articular cartilage tends to be low in signal intensity on fast spin echo T2 weighted images. 
fluid is very bright, so we really get a great interface between the fluid and the articular cartilage. So we still use this as one of our main sequences uh, <clears throat> because we reliably get low signal intensity within the cartilage and a nice, good, clear interface. With uh, protein density fat suppressed images or even T2 fat suppressed images, it changes a lot of the contrast here uh, and sometimes it's very, uh, very much more difficult to see the surface, especially if you have early degenerative changes within the cartilage. And here's what it looked like in the early days with, with fat suppression. And again, even with this old image with very noisy type image, you're starting to see that the, the actual surface layer is uh, not as clearly visualized once we do with the fat suppression. And in this particular sequence, that's primarily because once you suppress fat, then you're suppressing a lot of the noise, the signal, uh, so, so you're losing a lot of signal, and the noise stays about the same, so you have a significant drop in signal-to-noise ratio, and hence it looks very grainy. We can go to a higher TEs uh, here, and, and we, we, uh, you can see the contrast. What we've generally found is you don't need to go to a very high TE in order to get great contrast. And if you go, if you have your TE too high, you start losing signal to noise. And this is also dependent upon field strength. So in order to get a good contrast, we typically need a TE of around 60 at 1.5T. But at, at 3T, you can actually drop that down to around 35 or 40 to get good contrast. So at 3T, you can actually get increased signal-to-noise by going to double the field strength, but you can also get more signal-to-noise by decreasing the TE. So uh, there's a good reason why 3T should be better at evaluating the articular cartilage because there are two ways you can increase the signal-to-noise uh, in doing the imaging. If we go to a TE of 35 with fat suppression, this is a typical kind of a intermediate protein density type image. Again, we're starting to get Kind of uh, this is a normal articular cartilage, and we're we're getting a a little bit of more increased signal inhomogeneity within the articular cartilage, and this is a, a similar technique in patient. And uh, uh, you know, here's just a degenerated articular cartilage. We can see a, a, a congenital uh, dysplasia of the anterior compartment and in the secondary degenerative cartilage disease. So you're all familiar with that. That's, that's what it looks like using older gradient echo techniques. You can still see the, the thinning of the articular cartilage, but we're, we're really losing a lot of uh, details with these techniques. Some people in the past have liked STIR imaging. STIR, we never get adequate signal to noise and therefore adequate spatial resolution. Though, as you know, you can certainly see uh, defects that, where a fluid goes into a defect in the cartilage. And then you can certainly see the underlying uh, bony edema associated with it. Some of uh, the uh, uh, more recent techniques include Viper, which can be really a 3D technique. Here's Viper. This is 3D gradient echo. This is a T2 fat suppression and proton density. Uh, this is an intrinsically a 3D technique, so you can get higher actually spatial resolution with this particular technique. Uh, not everyone has it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, none of these techniques have really been shown to be ideal with cartilage imaging. Either you've got good contrast, but you don't have good 3D spatial resolution, or you have 3D spatial resolution, and the contrast isn't great for certain kinds of types of pathology. The most commonly one used here is probably the T2 fat suppression, though notice how grainy it is and it's kind of washed out. Uh, yeah. I, we prefer to do uh, lower TE fast spin echo imaging. This is probably around 100, uh, uh, TE of around 100. We typically like to do around 35 uh, TE to maximize contrast differences and also uh, signal to noise. But I'll show you some of the data that we have in terms of accuracy uh, of uh, correlating PD fat suppressed imaging with uh, arthroscopic findings and later lectures. Another technique that we use for, for quite a while is an ideal technique. Again, I can't go into the details here, but it's basically a 3D a technique which allows to get T2-weighted imaging. And with it, intrinsically, you get 
you get in phase and out of phase, that is fat suppressed and non fat suppressed imaging, as well as fat images and water images. So you get four different kinds of images with this technique. Uh, and uh, here we can see the cartilage. Uh, but again, there's not the best contrast between the, uh, the articular cartilage and fluid with these techniques. Okay, let me see. Okay, uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? Um, so two sagittal images. Um, we're looking at uh, fat sat and uh, 3D cube. Looks like there is an osteochondral uh, delamination injury of the patella yeah. and a free floating um, uh, cartilage there in the superpatellar joint space. And you see the focal defect there. Um, and it uh, looks like it's early delamination there. Yeah, this is probably a subacute injury where you, know, you certainly have a, a lot of uh, uh, edema in the bone, and you can see the loose fragment, as you said. So, so comminuted. Why, John? Comminuted. Yeah, comminuted. And uh, now th this is a fat suppressed type uh, technique. Shows the detail. And so that just shows an acute caudal fragment. Now, other techniques that have been used Fasten to include magnetization transfer. I'm really not going to talk about that anymore. Diffusion weighted image. The problem with diffusion weighted image is they're much better now, but still there's a really a lack of signal to noise and a lack of spatial resolution to get good imaging uh, with uh, diffusion weighted images. Uh, you can do MR arthrography where you can put in contrast and you can see the defects, uh, uh, but using regular standard techniques. I've not found that arthrography has any advantages, and it's got a lot of disadvantages. And I, as you know, I, I really think uh, unless you have to go in and physiologically change things by sticking a needle in and injecting uh, fluid under pressure, you really shouldn't do that because one of the great things that MR does is it allows us to evaluate the internal part of the body in its natural setting. Once you stick a needle in, it's not a natural setting anymore, and there are all kinds of uh, added variables that you put into the equation uh, once you go in and start injecting uh, fluid and in, in, in spaces. So let's see, Jennifer, what do you think about this case? All right, well, there, it looks like on the T1 arthrogram, Hard to tell. I don't see any definite contrast signal intensity in that cartilage defect, although it does appear bright on the PDFS. Okay. Um, so I think that. Yeah. This this is the. Well, let me see. Okay. Here are the sagittal images T1 and T2. Again, I don't see contrast signal intensity within that cartilage defect. So I think there's some evernation of the underlying bone, but the overlying cartilage is intact. Okay, good. Now, uh, uh, part of the problem here is when we look at just the T2 weighted images, the contrast was a little bit too concentrated and the, the contrast is dark. So it's hard to de determine what's happening here. <coughs> uh, many people, when they see this subchondral injury, they just make the direct assumption that there's a cartilage defect overlying it. Uh, the problem, and we'll talk about this over and over again, is that the cartilage, as you know, is very deformable. Deformable. The subchondral bone is rigid and not. So it's very common to have an impaction injury of the articular surface where the cartilage is able to, uh, to handle the blow, but you fracture the underlying bone because it's rigid. And then the overlying cartilage can still be intact, but the underlying bone is abnormal. So we're concerned about this. So we brought the patient back a couple of days later, and uh, I did just the T2-weighted image, and you can see this confirms your thought that the cartilage is intact. We just have a little bit of a uh, probably a chronic subchondral injury there. Uh, so uh, just uh, it's important to remember uh, that uh, the 
the formability of the cartilage in the bone are very different, so it's very possible to get injuries that affect the bone but don't uh, necessarily tear right away the cartilage. The problem is once you damage the subchondral bone, it affects the nutritional supply and the support to the overlying cartilage, so it probably means that this cartilage is at increased risk. In fact, most of the time when we go to some of the more sophisticated uh, imaging techniques that we're going to talk about here in a minute, we'll see that the cartilage here biochemically is not normal, even though it is intact. Can we, can we go to the previous image? I wanted to see the, or the one before the PD. I was just wondering, because I was just wondering, it's pretty bright. I guess, signal in the cartilage on the PD. Yeah. So, so you know at this point that the biochemistry of that cartilage is not going to be normal. Okay. <laughs> and we'll talk about what the biochemistry is a little bit later. <coughs> and that is cartilage that we consider at risk. Uh, uh, and we'll talk about that later too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so here's a patient that, that came in and was giving IV contrast for no uh, good documentable uh, medical reason, but it was just ordered that way. You've all seen those. Uh, this is a time when we, for some reason, we gave T1-weighted pre and post uh, images. And uh, what we can see is that there's an area here that looks pretty normal on the pre-contrast study, and the cartilage enhances with contrast on the post-contrast study. Uh, here. And uh, uh, here's kind of another example where here we have definitely abnormal cartilage on the T2 weighted image, but we can see that that particular area enhances on the post contrast images. Uh, I thought I was going to talk about what that's happening. No. Okay. I'll come back. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, so th th this just shows that areas of abnormal cartilage uh, can enhance with contrast. And in a minute, I'll come back to explain exactly what's happening biochemically, which causes this enhancement. Uh, okay, and then here's just uh, different techniques, T1-weighted image, a T2-weighted image, a protein density fat suppressed image. This is an area where there is a little bit of uh, signal abnormality. Uh, uh, this is really abnormal cartilage, but from a clinical standpoint, it's intact. This would be a focal area of grade one chondromalacia. Uh, but we, in studies I'll talk about in a minute, uh, this is a area of cartilage that is at, at risk for further degeneration. Okay. So, so the, the three current studies which are commonly used in evaluating articular cartilage after we go through all those fancy different techniques are proton density fat suppressed images, and in some people's hands they prefer T2 fat suppressed images. It's good at looking at cartilage thickness and signal intensity. Uh, the T2 fat suppressed images <clears throat> tend to give very dark signal within the cartilage, bright signal within the fluid, so you get very little. It's, a, it's kind of a black and white type image. image. Uh, it doesn't allow subtle evaluation of intermediate changes within the articular cartilage, and it tends to have poor signal to noise. Uh, <clears throat> and poor discrimination of the surface structures, uh, and therefore we prefer the protein density fat suppressed images. T2-weighted images without fat suppression are much better at looking at focal cartilage defects uh, because you, you get the uh, T2 uh, fluid is bright, the cartilage is dark, and you get ma much better signal to noise than when it's fat suppressed, so the image quality is better at the level of the articular cartilage than if you fat suppress it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I really think that way too, people do way too much fat suppression. Uh, fat is good. It's really a great contrast agent. And then uh, looking at cartilage morphology, you can do PD or T1, but it's, it's okay for car morphology, but you get morphology in these other two images, and the PD and T1 aren't great for looking at biochemical changes. So here is a, a paper that was published in 2016 looking at protein density fat suppressed images. And uh, they said that often you can see areas of signal abnormalities 
within articular cartilage on uh, the, the proton-density fat-suppressed images. <clears throat> and they found that basically four grades of signal changes that they then followed over a two-year period in these patients. One is a focal area's hypointensity. Another are inhomogeneous areas. Another are hyperintense areas. And then hyperintense areas with swelling. In this case, you may or may not have the underlying bone injury. <clears throat> Most of these do not have underlying bone injuries, so they followed these lesions in a cohort of patients over time. And what they, uh, uh, over 48 months. And so it's what they found is for the hyperintense lesions like we have here, most of them over a two year period would develop uh, cartilage thinning in the area of the hyperintensity. The hypointense defects would end up having focal fissures in the majority of them. Uh, the inhomogeneous defects would also go on to cartilage loss in that particular area, as did the swelling and hyperintense lesions. So basically, all of these signal changes within the articular cartilage over a two-year period, the majority of them actually showed progressive cartilage loss. So basically, any signal abnormality is a risk factor for uh, not doing well from uh, going forward. Now, not all of them developed the, these changes, but there was a very high statistical correlation with uh, all, all of these signal changes doing poorly over a two-year period. Now, if we assume the following, <coughs> which seems to be kind of confirmed by, by uh, pathology studies, that uh, the majority of, of disease of the uh, cartilage, it may or may not be due to uh, trauma, may be due to repetitive trauma over time. Some of it may just be due to lack of normal function. So what we know is if you overutilize joints, you'll lose, you'll have cartilage loss. If you underutilize joints, you also get cartilage loss. In fact, actually, John, weren't you doing the rabbit models where you found that if you restrained uh, motion in a joint in a rabbit that had normal articular cartilage. You had very rapid uh, destruction um, of articular cartilage. Yeah, yeah, it, it degenerated very rapidly when there was no motion. Uh, you cannot use um, uh, immobilization in rabbits. Yeah. And, and uh, so I, I tried to cast uh, the legs, but it, it didn't work out. Yeah. And the same thing occurs in in humans, and I think one of the reasons why older humans tend to have more degenerative disease is they become less active, and uh, the cartilage does not like that and tends to deteriorate. Well, our humans, uh, as you know, uh, have only two legs. So with two legs, you still have uh, stresses on articular surfaces of the uh, knees and hips, etc. Um, so uh, it's not like a rabbit that, that only that has four legs, okay. and uh, the stresses are different. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you cannot compare the human uh, structures to to that of a rabbit. Yeah, but, but um, you can you can keep a a human being in a, in a cast for two years, and you'll get um, osteopenia, but you will not uh, get um, degeneration as as such. Uh, so that that's a, a nice uh, a thing that humans uh, have over rabbit uh, over rabbits. But loss of use leads to abnormal biochemical. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the ideal situation nowadays, uh, the, the, it's thought that the, the, the sooner the motion, uh, the, the better the result in terms of uh, uh, saving their articular surfaces and in, 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 in the joints. Yeah. And then uh, we'll talk about some recent studies which have looked at uh, older individuals who have degenerative joint disease who then went and trained to run marathons and uh, to see the effect of that training 
on the articular cartilage of their knees. So I'll leave you with that thought and we'll come back to what the results were uh, probably in the next day or two in lectures. Yeah, that, 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 that change in, in, in the immobilization and what it can do uh, to, um, for instance, sprained ankles. We used to put uh, sprained ankles in uh, uh, fairly snug fitting casts, uh, but then eventually we started putting them in splints, yeah. uh, which is easier to put on and, and take off. And you can take them off to take showers and so on. Um, we used to use plaster at first, and then, of course, um, more fancy technology. Um, and, and so, um, and then we realized that uh, mobility was far better and uh, the results of uh, a loss of articular uh, cartilage was far better. Great. So, so you can get injury to the articular cartilage by acute trauma, especially if you have an intraarticular fracture, which you all know. But the most, most uh, cartilage disease occurs initially as biochemical changes, uh, degenerative changes. Just like essentially in cadaver studies, they found that 100% of patients who have rotator cuff tears have degenerative disease of the rotator cuff adjacent to the tear. So they start out with degenerative disease, it weakens the tendon, which then allows the tear to occur. Uh, the same thing occurs in most people who get degenerative, who get disease of the articular cartilage. It really starts out as a biochemical change that we'll, we're going to talk about. Now, looking at this pathology, the T2 mapping uh, looks at defects in the collagen scaffold. So those collagen fibers that we see, the most sensitive way to detect defects in those collagen fibers are with T2 mapping. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, or you can also use ultra-short TE imaging uh, to look at that. <clears throat> uh, T2 row is a technique uh, where you basically do T1 weighting images in what's called the rotating frame. This essentially gives you the kind of contrast that you would expect if you're able to go down to a zero magnetic field. Therefore, this is a technique which really looks for very large uh, molecules and gives the best uh, contrast for large molecules, and it's actually very good then for looking at the proteoglycan concentration uh, within articular cartilage. The gemmeric technique that we're going to talk about uh, is very good for looking at defects in glucosaminoglycans, which is also the proteoglycan uh, content. Uh, this, uh, uh, we'll go through that in a minute. And then sodium imaging is another imaging, but the, most of the sodium is actually in the proteoglycan area. So if you uh, change the technique, and instead of looking for water or hydrogen, you image on sodium, you could look at the proteoglycan, uh, but sodium is a much lower concentration. The signal to noise is much lower. Uh, none of the current clinical scanners are designed to image at the frequency of sodium, so it's really only for uh, research purposes. Uh, <clears throat> so of these techniques, the, the three that we've used uh, uh, most in evaluating, trying to evaluate articular cartilage of the degemeric technique, T2 mapping, and T1 row. Uh, same thing here. So T2 mapping, uh, this is basically a technique where you, you, you take a lot of data at different TE times. Uh, you then plot the, uh, the T2 exponential uh, and then calculate the exact T2 time of each of the voxels, the average T2 time of each of the voxels, and then display that, and typically people display it on a color type image, though you could do a grayscale as well. Uh, so this is just from a uh, 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 chapter or one of our textbooks uh, back in 2005, and Hollis Potter wrote a, a chapter on articular cartilage, and this was an image from, from that chapter. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, here's another article using T2 mapping, where you can see the different T2. As we know already know, the superficial layer has much longer T2 time than the deep layers. We saw that just with regular grayscale imaging. Here's a more sophisticated mapping technique showing uh, long T2 times superficially, uh, low T2 times uh, deeper. 
And this is in the normal cartilage over here, that normal layering that we've already talked about. When we get in an area of an osteochondral plug, we see very abnormal cartilage in this particular area. Here's another osteochondral defect, and we no longer see that nice layering effect. Uh, we see very abnormal signal and prolonged T2 time, even going into the deep layers here. So this is, uh, and, it, and then here we can see very abnormal articular cartilage over this uh, uh, osteochondral injury in this location. So by, by T2, we can see a disorganized structure with increased uh, T2 time uh, with, within that area. So uh, we, we did a study a couple of years ago that we published, I think the reference will come up here in a minute, where we did the T1 row imaging uh, and T2 mapping. We did both uh, 1.5 and 3T scanners to do this with. Uh, uh, and and uh, this is kind of the, the uh, resulting mapping that we got back. Notice that these techniques, because you have to do a lot of computational things, uh, the signal to noise is not great, which is which is a major problem. And we basically said because of the signal to noise problems in the thin articular cartilage, at 1.5 and 3T using these techniques, we weren't able to get really adequate data on the articular cartilages in the medial and lateral compartment really to uh, to compare them well with arthroscopy. So this is normal, uh, a normal kind of a appearance. <clears throat> And then this this is abnormal, where we we really we don't see that normal signal intensity within the cartilage. This is diffuse chondromalacia here in this particular patient, where you have very abnormal T2 times within the tissues. What we found, however, is that we could uh, reliably evaluate the patellar articular cartilage because it's more on a single plane and uh, it's uh, much thicker. So this is a study we published it in an orthopedic journal. Magnetic resonance imaging of the patellofemoral chondromalacia. Is there a role for T2 mapping? So we looked at the, PD, the standard PD fat set images, the T2 mapping techniques. We found the intra and uh, uh, intra and inter observer variabilities were quite acceptable uh, using these techniques. Uh, when we looked at comparing the MR findings with arthroscopic findings is what we actually found is that PD fat suppressed images missed about, a th uh, only, only found about a third of the cartilage lesions that could be seen arthroscopically. So despite our thought that PD fat set is very sensitive for articular cartilage disease, it's actually very insensitive. Though the specificity was high, if we saw a lesion with this, uh, it turned out to uh, uh, 80 percent of the time be confirmed at arthroscopy. With T2 mapping, what we found is that the sensitivity was double what it was with PD fat set, but the specificity was left. And, and I think the reason here is the PD fat set isn't a true biochemical technique, though it, it does uh, uh, look a little bit about biochemistry because of the, uh, the fluid shifts which occur. T2 mapping is much more of a biochemical technique, and I think what's happening here is that T2 mapping is picking up more uh, lesions than PD fat set. The, the problem here is that we would pick up lesions that were abnormal biochemistry, but by arthroscopy, it looked like normal cartilage. So, so this would, would really be kind of a pre-grade one lesion, uh, and I think most likely that this is actually indicative of the lack of sensitivity of arthroscopy to pick up early biochemical changes within the articular cartilage rather than a lack of specificity on the part of T2 mapping, but we, we don't know. Uh, so here's what the, uh, uh, the patella look like. This is a normal pat patella uh, with T2 mapping, and here's a very abnormal. Here we can see what looks like normal articular cartilage on the PD fat set, and here we can clearly see grade four chondromalacia and denudation of the articular cartilage here, and abnormal thinning of the articular cartilage more toward the median ridge, uh, which we can see on the uh, uh, T2 mapping. So using uh, arthroscopy as the gold standard, which probably is not the greatest gold standard for looking at biochemical changes of cartilage, uh, we found that uh, we have very good inter-observer variabilities, and uh, we had the lack of sensitivity of PD fat set and the uh, probable lack of sensitivity of arthroscopy for the T2 mapping. 
Okay. But when we did this study, we, we found that there was a problem that I want to leave you with. And that was, well, that we've talked a little bit about that the image quality for T2 mapping and T1 row, uh, row techniques are limited uh, uh, because of our lack of signal to noise and the lack of spatial resolution that we have for articular cartilage of the medial and lateral compartments. What I'm hoping to do this year in working with uh, Cedar sinai and uh, Siemens is to try to use some newly developed uh, uh, AI techniques to be able to take MR image, uh, imaging acquisitions and get much higher spatial resolution out of the images uh, with improved signal to noise. And then maybe we can start using these techniques to evaluate the articular cartilage of the medial and lateral compartments, especially the femoral condyles, in a reasonable time period. But that, that's hopefully something I hope to get started uh, later this fall. Another problem that we had, uh, which we have with this, is even if we come up with a technique that can detect earlier disease in articular cartilage, which we may be able to show is a precursor to clinically significant disease. Now, the question still remains, uh, what difference does it make if we can't treat it? But the issue here is that if you can't make the diagnosis, then you really can't develop preventative measures and new treatment techniques. So unless we can make the diagnosis, we're not going to develop those techniques. So the first thing we need to do is be able to uh, find techniques to allow us to see early lesions that may be reversible in our articular cartilage so we can develop uh, preventative measures and new treatments that can abort the progression of the disease so that it does not become clinically important. So th that's the uh, that's what we're we're facing right now. Now, something that came out of this, an attempt to correlate arthroscopic grading of articular cartilage with MRI, uh, we actually found initially that we had very poor correlation between the number and locations of lesions detected by MRI and where they were detected arthroscopically. <clears throat> uh, and this was a, this turned out to be a major problem and using arthroscopy as a gold standard. So we couldn't figure out why, because the orthopedic surgeons could look at the MR and see the lesions. The radiologists could look at their arth arthroscopic uh, videos and see the lesions, but they just didn't seem to correlate very well between the two. Uh, so one of the fellows uh, said, well, let's take five cadaver knees and we will uh, take those, we will do MR scans on all, or six, I guess, six cadaver knees. We'll then take them to the operating room. Uh, we'll put in suture anchors around the periphery of where we can see the peripheral components of articular cartilage arthroscopy. We'll then disarticulate the knees. Uh, well, I'm sorry. We'll then, we'll, we'll then do the MR scan uh, with the... Uh, suture anchors in place so we know where the limits of visualization are arthroscopically. We'll then take the, the uh, cadaver knees out of the MR scanner. We'll disarticulate the knees and look at all pathologi pathologically under the gross growth pathology as the gold standard. So we used uh, gross dissection as the gold standard here. So this is just kind of a, a video of uh, uh, an arthroscopy putting in suture anchors at different degrees of flexion of the, of, the, uh, of the cadaver knees to see how far back we could see the articular cartilage. And then we look medially and laterally and anteriorly. <clears throat> and this is what an arthroscopic image looks like. Uh, here's the, the articular cartilage. And then we would take put in suture anchors. We, I mean the orthopedic fellow, around the periphery of the visualized portions of the articular of the cartilage. This is what the MR scan looked like. So we can see the suture anchors here uh, around the periphery of the visualized area uh, at, uh, at, at MR imaging. And then, then we uh, disarticulated it and looked at the gross specimen. So what we found that arthroscopically, if you looked at where the suture anchors were at 90 degrees and 120 degrees of flexion, 
Uh, arthroscopically, you can see about five or six millimeters beyond that at 90 degrees, five beyond it at, at arthroscopy. When you did a gross dissection, you could see uh, four centimeter, four and a half centimeters beyond the uh, suture anchor uh, at 90 degrees and uh, three centimeters at 120 degrees by MR was very similar to, to the gross dissection. So what we found is that uh, more than 80% of the articular cartilage uh, in the posteriorly proximal to the menisci, which we see at MRI, cannot be visualized at routine arthroscopy. So the problem that we have is when we called a lesion, there was a posterior lesion on the MR examination, we were talking about a posterior lesion being back here. This turns out to be an area that's not just seen arthroscopically. So they wouldn't see any of these lesions. And then if you actually look at the criteria for calling posterior, central, and anterior arthroscopically, what was called posterior arthroscopically is just this area over the, over the, the meniscus. Centrally was here, and arthroscopically you could not see the articular cartilage uh, overlying the anterior horn. This is the lateral side. This is the medial side. So the reason that we were having difficulty in correlating the MR and the, and the arthroscopy was the fact that we were basically talking apples and oranges because none of us recognized these limitations uh, arthroscopically. So when you describe a lesion uh, at MR scanning, you got to remember the fact that this, that we, we call the far posterior zone, the orthos orthopedic uh, fellows in this study call this the hidden zone. <clears throat> These far posterior lesions are not seen arthroscopically unless the surgeon puts in a, a posterior portal, which is a little bit dangerous. And then anterior, central, and posterior would be lesions in this location. John? All we have is a, is a probe uh, that we can use to, uh, to feel how soft the articular surface is. Um, if you don't see any lesion, uh, you, 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 you probe uh, the articular surface and you feel for softness, uh, which then you, you, you call the number one um, um, degeneration. Um, right. And, and so that's a rather gross um, uh, technology to, to figure out something as delicate as an articular surface. Um, and, and ergo, uh, I think um, using an MR will always give you a better picture. And besides, uh, uh, besides the, the fact that you cannot see all the areas in any um, uh, that you can that 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 you cannot see um, um, arthroscopically. Um, arthroscopically, you, you cannot feel areas um, nearly as well as you can see them on the uh, uh, on the MRI. Thanks, John. Great. Okay, uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay, so C2 and short condensate fat that sagittal images. Looks like there might be some cartilage abnormality in kind of the August 44 year old female with knee pain after doing squat. So there might be some cartilage abnormality in the kind of far posterior non wave area right there, some underlying subchondral marrow edema. So, so one of the concerns is okay, so maybe this far posterior zone isn't very important. Mm -hmm. But it turns out in many di different athletic <coughs> activities, this is a very important articulating surface. If you try to jump, if you try to uh, change direction, uh, most, most of that, you've got major forces when the knee is flexed mm -hmm. and you're against the ground. So there is a, a lot of force that can go through the articular cartilage in this far posterior zone, and this just shows injury to the articular cartilage and the subchondral bone uh, due to squatting exercises at the gym. Uh, and it just shows that uh, uh, you can have up to seven times body weight uh, through the knee when you change directions in sports activities. And you can see here in playing tennis that 
uh, uh, where you can get a lot of pressure, up to seven times body weight, in that flex position in the knee. So we found that this is actually a common area of degenerative disease in uh, tennis players. Uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? Um, so it looks like there is, uh, on the far posterior zone, the mediathermal uh, condyle looks like a lot of um, hibernation and cystic change. The cartilage looks very irregular. There's some deep fissuring. And there might also be some meniscal signal there. That's abnormal. Yeah, I'm not too worried about the meniscal signal. Uh, here at so, so this was a former professional uh, tennis, a female tennis player. And you can see where the degenerative disease in this day <coughs> is in this far posterior area uh, due to the, the mechanism we're talking about. Here's what it looks like in the coronal plane. And if you look, this is actually here, you can see it's both on the medial and lateral femoral condyles. Uh, this is a common location. What we found that about 2% of our knee MRIs uh, show uh, lesions in this location is the only abnormality uh, to explain uh, symptoms. And we find that in all cases, it's about 5% of all knees will show pathology in this particular area. So, so we think it is important. So key findings from this study is uh, that we need to, the radiologist and orthopedics need to have a common nomenclature for describing locations of these cartilage lesions. Uh, the articular cartilage in the posterior condyles is not routinely visualized, uh, but pathology in that area is actually common. If you think about 5% of all knees, we're talking about one out of 20 MRs. That means you're going to see it at least once a day on average, which which makes it common. So why don't John? Well, one of the, excuse me, John. One of the problems with um, arthroscopic procedures, um, it, it, it's uh, fairly easy to deal with um, um, articular pathology where you can um, open the knee and, 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 and perform whatever you need to do, excise the piece of articular surface or whatever, uh, you can do it um, fairly easily. But if you have to uh, turn a corner and go behind the knee and try to do that, that's impossible to do. So you, you can go uh, and, and do these things posteriorly uh, with a posterior approach, but uh, that becomes really technically very difficult. So uh, we're kind of um, um, looking for a better way to do things. Um, someday maybe we'll find them. Great. Thanks, John. Well, any qu why don't we stop here and we'll pick up... Uh, uh, let's see, today's uh, Thursday with uh, <clears throat> going further here. Any questions? All right. Well, everybody have a good evening and uh, 